Well, good morning, all of you from the office of the Southeast Europe Association in Munich. A very cordial welcome to our panel discussion on the topic biodiversity and nature conservation in the Western Balkans, the key of the EU, the biodiversity strategy 2030, and the green agenda for the Western Balkans. This panel was supposed to be the second panel of an international workshop of the Southeast Europe Association and our partner Euro Natur, Euro Natur on the topic biodiversity and the protection of nature in the Western Balkans, civil society, local politics, international actors, and the media in dialogue. It is in fact part of an ongoing project on the same topic that is supported by the Stability Pact for Southeast Europe via the German Federal Foreign Office. The event was to take place at Freising near Munich in a hybrid format today and tomorrow. We were looking forward to host more than 20 participants plus the same number of people connected online. Our participants, besides from the institutions represented here today at this panel, were supposed to be experts from civil society, from academia, local governments, line ministries, relevant international organizations, representatives from the media, from the Western Balkans, and from Western Europe. The aggravating situation of the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in the south of Germany, ultimately forced us to cancel the event at this point in time. We will postpone it to the spring, most probably to the end of March. In parallel, we decided to keep to one of our panels and present it online to a somewhat broader audience. That is where we are here today. The reason why we selected this topic mostly lies in the fact that there is now a special dynamic in the implementation of the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans, one year after the so-called SOFIA Declaration, and we felt that this is therefore an issue that should be discussed as early as possible. Special welcome to our speakers and our moderator, Simon Ilse. Thank you for taking this chair. Welcome to all other envisaged invis participants of our workshop and a special welcome to all those uh, of you who came on board for the first time having received the invitation to this online event. With this, I'm giving over to Simon Ilse. Yes, also from my side, very warm welcome and good morning to everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Brey and the Southeast Europe Association, as well as Eure Natur for having me. Uh, my name is Simon Ilse, I'm your chair today, um, and I'm greeting you from uh, Belgrade here, from the office of uh, Heinrich Bell uh, Foundation um, in Belgrade. And uh, thanks really for organizing such an important um, event um, of a topic of vast importance, but also increasing public resonance. Um, and, um, and as you said, um, a dynamic, uh, let's say, implementation um, process at the moment. So um, a very warm welcome um, to the panelists um, this morning. We have um, with us um, Guillet, um, Guillemette Vaché, the member of the Center for Thematic Expertise and Connectivity and Networks from the Director General Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiations, also known as DJ NIR from the European Commission in Brussels. Um, welcome, thanks for being here. We will um, shortly um, pass the floor over to you for your keynote. Then there is with us Mr. Radovan Nikšević, expert on connectivity from the Regional Cooperation Council Secretariat based in Sarajevo. Welcome to you. Um, then we have Pippa Gallop, um, the Southeast Europe Energy Advisor, um, and I'm sure very well known to all of us um, from Bankwatch based in Zagreb. Uh, welcome, um, Pippa. And um, then we have Goran Sekulic, Policy Officer from the Worldwide Fund for Nature, uh, WWF or WWF Adria, uh, based in Belgrade. Good morning, Goran. Um, just a few uh, words on, um, on housekeeping rules. Um, this is a, a public event uh, which is recorded and will later on also publicly be um, publicized and, and be rendered available. 
Um, this is a webinar form, so um, please uh, feel free to participate in the discussion. Uh, of course, we would have uh, preferred to have this in, in person, um, but as Mr. Bry um, mentioned, it's not possible, but we would like to keep it as interactive as possible. So feel free to um, make comments, pose your questions in the Q&A function um, at the bottom of the screen. Um, also, if you have something that you would like to um, comment and, and voice uh, your question or comments, uh, please raise your hand and we'll make the, um, we, we will try to accommodate your comment and question um, and here in live. But first of all, we will do, we will listen to um, Ms. Vache for the, for the keynote um, and then have a round of uh, responses and inputs by the panelists and then open the floor uh, for, for everyone to join the discussion. Um, thank you very much. And Guillemet, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, and good morning to all from my side. Um, I will share a few slides, so let me first switch off my, my camera and bear with me just the time that I upload the, the slides. So, um, I'm here in a minute. So I hope you can uh, see the slides. Not yet, but it's ah. charging. <laughs> yes, now. Perfect. OK. All right. OK, so um, good morning again uh, from, from my side. I'm very pleased to, to be with uh, all of you online. Uh, it would have been indeed good to, to meet in person, but as mentioned, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the workshop has been postponed to, uh, to spring. Um, as mentioned by, by Simon, I, I work in, uh, in the European Commission in the GNIR, and I'm a policy uh, officer and chapter desk on, uh, on environment and, and climate change. I actually moved the team recently, so I'm uh, now in a thematic unit, but basically the, the point is that I, I'm providing support horizontally on, on climate change and environment, so not only on, on biodiversity, but on much wider scope, to my colleagues who are themselves dealing with most precisely with specific countries or specific region. Um, today, I was tasked to set a bit the scene on uh, the key of the EU, the biodiversity strategy for 2030 and the Green Agenda for the, for the Western Balkans. Um, the idea is to, to then trigger indeed the discussion. So I will try not to enter too much into details and, and focus on a uh, on few key messages. And of course, if you need uh, further information or clarification, I'm, uh, I'm available uh, after, after this event uh, and will answer to you with pleasure. I also would like to apologize because I will have to, to leave a bit earlier uh, than the end of, of the session. So, so sorry for that. I have another commitment uh, afterwards. Um, so just to start with uh, where we are uh, coming from, whether it's from, for the biodiversity strategy <clears throat> or for the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans, both were uh, foreseen in, uh, in the European Green Deal in its, in its roadmap. Uh, you all heard about it, I guess, I hope. Uh, and uh, just to recall that uh, it was proposed by the European Commission in December 2019, following mobilization from the YAOs from the civil society over the summer uh, that year, and also following, of course, the, uh, uh, European election, the election of, of the European Parliament, which shows also the, the green issues uh, coming high on the agenda. So this uh, European Green Deal is, uh, is a communication uh, for um, framing the work of, of the Commission for this mandate, but also beyond. And it can be basically understood that the EU answer to, to Paris Agreement, but not only, actually it goes really beyond. And as you can see on the slide, there are really many sectors uh, involved. The idea is to change environmental and climate challenges into opportunities and to decouple growth um, from emission and pollution. So you can see here that it concerns energy, it concerns transport, agriculture, and of course, uh, biodiversity. And there are also two principles which are at the core of the European Green Deal the do no harm principle and the mainstreaming principle. So to cut it uh, short, uh, um, for the sectors which are not uh, on, on the chart and which are not directly targeted 
by the European Green Deal, still the do no harm principle establishes that um, those sectors should also be sustainable and should do no harm to uh, environmental objectives. And it's linked with the second principle of mainstreaming, which basically put all EU policies and all EU actions um, as a center of, uh, I mean, basically having to contribute to the European Green Deal objective. So there's really a need of, uh, of doing things differently and of mainstreaming environment and climate in all, all sectors, uh, which is a bit complex and a bit challenging, of course. Um, but the idea is to uh, is to act to uh, address the triple crisis, of course, of uh, biodiversity, climate, and pollution. So it's it's really a big change in the way um, EU policies and and legislation are done, and it's uh, also a change in the way ACI is uh, is done. Basically, uh, I would like now to zoom on two actions foreseen in the roadmap of the Green Deal, and which are circled in blue on this slide. So basically the biodiversity strategy and uh, the green agenda for the Western Balkans. So the biodiversity strategy being linked to the part on nature of the green deal and the green agenda for the Western Balkans being foreseen by uh, the external dimension of the green deal. Um, so to start with the biodiversity strategy for 2030, uh, let me just first recall some, some basics, uh, and, and namely the fact that biodiversity really underpins sustainable development. So while all sustainable goals are, are equal and there is no specific hierarchy among um, the three dimensions of sustainable development, so economy, society, and biosphere, as you can see on, on the chart, at the same time, it's really hard not to notice that our well-being and our prosperity really depends on a healthy and, and resilient ecosystem. So uh, the biodiversity strategy will look at the, I mean, is looking at the biodiversity loss, which basically are a threat for, for humanity. It's also important to, to recall that almost half of the global uh, GDP is linked to nature and, there are, and that there are really connection between biodiversity loss climate change and, and biodiversity uh, and pandemic, sorry. Indeed, if there is one silver lining of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's really the increasing awareness of, of those links uh, that connect the health of human being, animal or planet, um, its uh, terrestrial and marine biodiversity. So really we can't address biodiversity loss without addressing climate change and we can't address climate change unless we, we tackle biodiversity loss at, at the same time. So that was just to, to set a bit of the scene. Now, um, on, on the main elements of, uh, of the biodiversity itself, you can see the four main blocks here on the slide. Um, one, uh, I mean, the, the, the first block is about uh, protecting nature and establishing a larger EU-wide network of protected areas on both land and sea. So this is based on the already existing Natura 2000 uh, areas. Then second block is to restore nature um, and to launch a EU nature restoration plan, which will include um, some, uh, some binding targets on, on restoration um, through a, a law to come by, by the end of this year. The third block is to enable transformative change. And here, <clears throat> sorry, we're looking at unlocking funding and uh, setting in motion a new uh, governance framework. <clears throat> Uh, how to track progress, uh, how to uh, improve knowledge exchange, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and, and final block is uh, on the EU for an ambitious global agenda. So basically on, uh, on biodiversity diplomacy uh, because the biodiversity crisis must come to, to the front, front, forefront of the global political agenda, just like climate change did with, with the Paris Agreement in 2015, the UN biodiversity Biodiversity Conference in Kuming, so the COP15, must be the Paris moment for, for biodiversity. And that's really something uh, which has been stressed recently by, uh, by our president, Ursula von der Leyen. So leading by example, uh, as set out in the, in the biodiversity, uh, the EU will really press hard for a new post-2020 uh, global biodiversity framework, which will be discussed at, uh, at the COP. Um, and uh, to this end, we really are expanding our, our biodiversity diplomacy to build a global coalition for a successful COP. And of course, the Western Balkans should, should be part of it. Um, here, I just put in a, a few uh, figures, uh, which actually, uh, I mean, key figures, which are uh, from coming from the biodiversity strategy. 
I will not, not enter into details, uh, but it's, it's uh, a good overview to, to see all the, the different objectives and, and actions that the EU has set in, in this uh, biodiversity strategy. So, for example, the objective of turning at least 30% of EU lands and 30% of seas into effectively managed and coherent protected areas. And also one other uh, point which I find is interesting is to reduce the use and risk of pesticides by at least 50%. Uh, but there are a few others, and I, I will share my presentation afterwards. So, of course, you can have a closer look. Um, now, how is this all relevant for, for the Western Balkans? Uh, well, first of all, and as mentioned in, in the European Green Deal, uh, the ecological transition for Europe can only be effective if, if the EU uh, immediate neighbors also take effective action. You will note as well that we are talking about the European Green Deal and not the EU Green Deal, European meaning Europe as a continent, so including the Western Balkans, of course. Uh, because of course, the, it is all the more valid. I mean, it's important to include neighbors, but it is all the more valid for Western Balkan countries in general, given their European perspective. Uh, and this perspective implies commitment for, for them to align with evolving EU key, as well as with the 2030 agenda and the Paris Agreement. So the direction of EU policies and the biodiversity strategy is one of them, is really critical for, for their own action. Um, so basically, uh, what, what I've been describing on, on the biodiversity strategy gives really the direction of travel which of course uh, the, the Western Balkans have, will have to, to comply with when approximating with the UI key, but of course at, a, at their own space, own pace, sorry, and with, with different starting points. So that's why uh, the European Green Deal has put forward the proposal to have a green agenda for the Western Balkans. And this green agenda is basically to reflect the Green Deal in the region, um, so the, all the transformative policies of, of the Green Deal to be reflected in, in the region. So five main pillars that you can see on the left part of, uh, of the slide. Um, so decarbonization and resilience. Here we're talking about climate, transport and energy, agri-food measure, and actually also sustainable rural development, circular economy, biodiversity, depollution of air, water and soil. Um, so that's the fine main, main pillar of the green agenda. So you, you, you will notice that one is dedicated to biodiversity. And then briefly on, on the three uh, milestone uh, on, and also on where we are in terms of, of timing and of, of process. Um, so the, the first one were already mentioned by, by Ansio, but let me just recall a bit uh, in detail what, what they entail. So the first step was in October, 2020. Uh, the Commission had put forward some guidelines on the Green Agenda annexed to an economic and investment plan for the region. Basically, the economic and investment plan is the EU blueprint for financial engagement in the region, which puts forward a, a substantial investment package, mobilizing up to 30 billion of funding as a combination of grants, uh, guarantees and loans uh, for, the, for the region. So accompanying this EIP, there was uh, some guideline on, on the green agenda, which need to be understand that basically the proposal of the commission to have a green agenda, which, were, which is basically an internal document of, of the commission uh, made in cooperation, uh, in close cooperation with, with seven services. And following this proposal, the Western Balkan leaders Endorse um, at, Sofia de, uh, at the Sofia summit within the Valley's process, uh, the Sofia declaration on, on the Green Agenda, so one month later. And here they're really committed to, to concrete actions, both at regional and national level, including on biodiversity. Um, I, I think it's very important to, to stress here that, you know, the Sofia declaration really shows that the region also own, own the process. Of course, it's a political declaration and the key will be in this implementation, but I, I think it's already a very, a very good uh, sign to you know, the, the society and the citizens and, and businesses as well. And final step, uh, which was, I mean, not final, but the last step, sorry, because there will be many other steps, is this year in October uh, 2021, uh, still within the Berlin summit, uh, but at Bordeaux, sorry for, for my pronunciation, uh, in Slovenia, basically the Western Balkan leaders agrees to, agreed to a more detailed action plan and uh, roadmaps on, uh, on the green agenda for the Western Balkans. 
I will let uh, Radovan explain a bit more into details um, and indeed uh, present you the, the action plan. But just to say that, um, that the idea here was really to have a more precise timelines and more precise uh, stakeholders, uh, most, uh, mostly regional organization assigned to each action of, of the SOFIA declaration. And then there is also a part dedicated to uh, governance of the Green Agenda. And as I said, also some roadmaps, uh, one per pillar, more or less, and, and indeed one, one on, uh, on biodiversity. Uh, I will not enter into details of, uh, of you know, all the actions proposed on biodiversity uh, along those, uh, those three steps, which basically have been further refining uh, you know, the, the five pillars of the Green Agenda. But maybe just to stress that uh, through the SOFIA declaration and following uh, action plan, the Western Balkans partner have really been committing to align their policies with the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030. And this involves uh, developing and implementing a Western Balkans uh, biodiversity strategic plan, um, including uh, means for joint implementation, monitoring, and reporting. Other actions to which they committed is to prepare natural protection and restoration plan, also forest landscape re restoration plan, analyze uh, benefits of natural-based solution to fight uh, climate change, strengthen uh, regional cooperation, and finally, and that's a new element brought by Bordeaux Declaration, also look at uh, uh, greening connectivity and, and green infrastructure. Um, just my last slide would be on a, a few uh, principles or let's say messages that uh, I have uh, uh, gathered also in my interaction, various interaction with uh, various stakeholders. Um, so, so just to recall indeed that um, uh, the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans needs to be uh, looked at as a medium to long-term process. Uh, basically, it's it an action, I mean, the action plan that we did in Bordeaux is really for the next decade. Uh, it, there will be substantive uh, changes which are required, so it, we need time and uh, basically we will uh, wait a bit before we see really the fruit of our efforts because changing to the green paradigm will not happen in one day. Uh, it's of course linked to the, to the political process of enlargement and of approximation with EU, which is, as you know, quite, quite complex and you know, has uh, its particularities. So, so just to keep in mind that indeed, uh, uh, I mean, things, uh, change, things will not change in, uh, in one day. Then, uh, as I already mentioned, key is really the implementation, um, because as a well with, with IT approximation, uh, it's, it's one thing to, to commit a strategic and political level, but it's indeed very important to, think, to see things uh, moving on the ground. Uh, and for that, ownership and assistance are crucial. So ownership um, is ensured at highest political level, and assistance is, uh, is also uh, ensured from uh, many actors, be it uh, European Commission, but also member states. And I can also stress uh, IFIs, so international financial institutions, who are ready to invest uh, uh, on the green transition in the region. Um, then I said implementation across the board, because um, as you saw from the Green Deal chart, it's, uh, it's really, I mean, the ambitious of the Green Agenda, ambition of the Green Agenda goes beyond climate and energy policies. It, it really fosters uh, linkages between all policy areas and requires therefore a whole of economy and whole of society approach. And that's why and where it's everybody's responsibility to implement the Green Agenda. We really need to join forces I mean, EU has no magic stick to, to make things happen and neither have national authorities. We all have our responsibility. And I think civil society and local communities as well will, will play a crucial role in, in this part, in basically in supporting reforms, uh, supporting efforts, as well as, of course, mobilizing citizens and leaders to at all levels for just an, an inclusive and green, green transition. For example, uh, for the COP15, uh, mobilizing the, the Western Balkans on, uh, on uh, the EU effort. Um, and, and finally, uh, just to, to be sure, to, to conclude on, on, on the fact that the Green Agenda is also not only about uh, financing. Of course, there is a lot of, of support out there available, as I mentioned, in international financial institution. Uh, our instrument in the European Commission uh, on, uh, uh, on pre-accession, 
also, of course, uh, national authorities will have to, to develop their own resources to, to put a price on, on pollution, for example. But indeed, beyond financing, I mean, efforts are, are needed uh, to make the green agenda happen at the regulatory level, uh, on the consumer behaviors, on uh, implementing best practices, and also on enhancing regional cooperation. On our side, uh, we will uh, also provide some capacity building through regional projects. We are also looking at mainstreaming environment and climate change in our assistance, in our bilateral and regional uh, support. And we are also um, trying to, to green step-by-step -step, uh, our cooperation framework. For example, we have uh, the economic reform uh, program, which are produced each year by the Western Balkans to explain what are the structural reforms which are empowering the, the um, competitiveness? And, and since uh, this year, this will include a, a dedicated section on, on green transition. Sorry, I was a bit long and I went into many details, but uh, I hope I managed to, to set the scene and I'm looking forward to the, the discussion. Thank you for your attention. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Fahey. This is, um, was very good in setting the stage indeed and uh, in laying out this um, quite ambitious um, uh, program that, uh, um, that Europe and the EU has, has given itself. And um, I'm just reminding also the audience, the promise is nothing less than taking Europe's biodiversity on the path to recovery by 2030. And, um, and this is also, of course, against the background that we have lost um, uh, around 60% of global wildlife populations in the last 40 years. And I think, um, it is very, very uh, uh, applaudable and, and, and great that there's from the start actually an outreach uh, to the Western Balkans because the Western Balkans have a very high degree in biodiversity, beautiful nature and landscapes um, and an extraordinary uh, wildlife um, populations. So, um, so this is, I think, uh, very important to say also that, that we cannot stop this loss of biodiversity, um, neither render Europe um, climate neutral uh, continent without the Western Balkans. Um, so thank you very much and, and um, great that this is um, with the Green Agenda for the Balkans and the Action Plan now um, going ahead. Um, I would like to continue with uh, Radovan Nicevic um, from the RCC. Uh, basically, if you now, if now we've, we've seen, we have the EU biodiversity strategy on the one hand, 2030, and now we have the Action Plan for the Green Agenda. Um, do you, do you feel good about this, this, this uh, document? Uh, where do you see drivers and blockades of you know, implementation? I would really like you to focus on the regional implementation. Um, where, do you, where, where would you see, we of course at the beginning of a process, but at the same time, we don't have um, much, much time to lose. So um, where do you really see um, points, uh, points of entry and, and, and points where, where we can kickstart the process? Uh, together and also just a, a small note to the audience if you have any um, also questions of understanding or clarifications of concepts uh, just please feel free to um, to post them in the in the Q&A or on the chat we will try to um, answer them parallelly um, over to you um, Radovan thank you okay uh, thank you thank you Simon and good morning everybody I would like to greet you all on behalf of the regional cooperation council and thank you for having me today and recognizing our role in this important process of ecological transformation. So uh, before, before I answer your question about the implementation challenges uh, that the Western Balkans is facing, just let me add something to, 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 to explain the, bit, uh, the whole concept a bit more. So as uh, Gilmet uh, explained at, at the beginning in, in her intervention, uh, we have the European Green Deal is a, a long-term vision for a comprehensive ecological transformation, which goes beyond uh, the, the, the borders of the, uh, the European Union. So of course it includes the Western Balkan as, a, as an immediate uh, neighbor of EU member states. Uh, however, we are all aware that um, the documents, policy documents and the legal documents which are developed and which will be developed under the European Green Deal have uh, on the Western Balkan economies have rather a limited impact because they are of course 
legal acts which are valid in the European Union. So that's the reason why we in the Western Balkans needed something, a political declaration, a political commitment through which our governments will uh, commit to adhere or to transpose the objectives of the European Green Deal into our policy and the legal frameworks. So uh, soon after the adoption of the European Green Deal, it was December 2019, RCC was invited to coordinate the process of de development with uh, political declaration. And as Guillemette already mentioned, this declaration is adopted in Sofia uh, about a year ago. Uh, in this declaration, the leaders, the Western Balkan leaders invited us, invited RCC, uh, to coordinate the process of implementation of the Sofia declaration, to prepare uh, an action plan, to develop roadmaps for each seven components of the of the Sofia Declaration and Gurmet already mentioned climate change, trans sustainable transport, sustainable energy, depollution, uh, circular economy, sustainable agriculture, and of course, last but not least, nature and biodiversity protection. Uh, the leaders also invited us uh, in this process to develop a monitoring system, to, to establish a regular reporting system, and to somehow describe and develop all necessary platforms for uh, successful and smooth implementation of the SOFIA Declaration. And that is actually what we were doing during the previous year. We developed this action plan with seven roadmaps that I mentioned. We also uh, proposed a governance structure uh, which will be uh, based on our regional, actually uh, our regional working group on environment, which is established six years ago, will be a backbone of this uh, intergovernmental cooperation process that will be responsible for, for coordinating the implementation in the future. Also, all other ministries from Western Balkan governments, not only ministries of environment, will be uh, will participate in this work. And also, our action plan foresees establishing various platforms that will support the whole the entire process, like NGO forum. We already initiated it. Uh, also, the action plan foresees cooperation among municipalities because indeed they are uh, municipalities are uh, play important role in implementing policies which are developed uh, at national level. And through this, we would like to, to establish this vertical uh, coordination mechanism to hear what works well from, from the field, what works well, what cannot work uh, in, the, in this uh, policy making process. So uh, the, the action plan somehow provides uh, tools for monitoring, for reporting, and proposes these structures which will be used uh, in, the, in the process of implementation. The action plan is divided in three parts. The first part is action plan itself. It lists all measures from the SOFIA declaration, but in addition to, to measures, it tries to set some, some deadlines for each measure. And also the action plan identifies regional coordinators uh, that which will be in charge of coordinating every single action and which will be responsible for, for the results, of course. And talking about regional coordinators, they are mostly, mainly the, the reg regional organizations that have a mandate in certain policy areas, such as uh, the energy community, uh, transport community secretariat, a standing working group on regional rural development, which is active in the area of agriculture, then International Union for, for Conservation of Nature that will play an important role in the implementation of biodiversity uh, pillar, and of course, uh, RCC will also play, uh, let's say, an important role in the implementation uh, through the working group that I already mentioned, working group on environment, uh, which is a regional intergovernmental uh, body. Uh, the, the second part, uh, which, which uh, has seven roadmaps, provide more detailed, uh, let's say, step-by-step -step guide for Western Balkan economies on how to uh, transpose ob objectives of the European Green Deal into all seven components and how to somehow how to put uh, our, let's say, policy and legal framework on the right track tracks for achieving climate neutrality by 2050 as the overarching uh, goal of the European Green Deal and the SOFIA Declaration as well. 
uh, what is important to, to, to mention maybe in this, of course, the, the climate, uh, climate roadmap and climate component is maybe the key, the key element of the, of the roadmap since uh, climate objectives are firmly embedded into all other components uh, of the action plan. Uh, when we were developing this, um, this uh, roadmap, we took into account the new EU climate law, the new, uh, the new uh, adaptation strategy for the European Union, and uh, recently uh, published uh, Fit for 55 package. Uh, also, in the area of biodiversity, uh, the, the roadmap foresees uh, in the first phase developing of some baseline studies which were which will analyze situation in the region while uh, the second phase will be focused more on developing some uh, concrete uh, strategies like uh, um, uh, regional um, biodiversity strategic plan which will try to transpose all elements that Gilmet just mentioned all elements from the EU biodiversity strategy, and so on and so on. Uh, I would not take more time about explaining the, the, the action plan itself because it is available, publicly available document, and I think everyone who is interested can, can download it. I will now focus briefly on your, on your question about the implementation and what are the challenges in the Western Balkans. I think that the biggest challenge, actually maybe I would like to emphasize two challenges. First of all, uh, there is a big delay uh, in uh, transposition and enforcement, transposition of uh, EU legal and policy framework, and also a lot of challenges uh, in the process of enforcement in the Western Balkans. So that is the first thing we will have to, to, to address uh, in the process of implementation. So delay in transposition of, uh, of a key communitaire in, in, the, in the legal framework of Western Balkan economics. Because why it is important? Because we committed to achieve climate neutrality, but this uh, objective has to be achieved in the same point of time as the EU member states, which it, it is 2050, and EU member states are already progressing well, advancing on their climate neutrality path. Uh, another big challenge for the implementation will be financing, of course. Uh, we all know that this uh, actually all measure, the, the, the chapter 27 on, on environment is the most expensive chapter, chapter. And of course, having in mind the, the, the scope of the Green Deal and the SOFIA declaration, the Green Agenda, uh, it's simply impossible to imagine how much this, uh, this comprehensive ecological transformation will cost Western Balkan economy. Uh, literally every single euro which will be invested in economic development will have to have this green component and to be invested wisely and always having in mind necessity, the necessity of green and ecological transformation towards climate neutrality. So I think I already wasted, spent my, used my seven minutes for intervention. So I would stop here, but anyway, I will, I will try to answer questions if, if there is any. Thanks a lot, um, um, Yes, I think you laid it out well. Um, that actually the, the action plan is a very procedural uh, document. It, it lays really out a, a plan, um, but falls maybe a bit short of the very clear political commitments that the biodiversity strategy of the EU has in terms of you know 30% um, protected lands and 30% protected seas um, as a clear as a clear goal. Um, um, but of course, uh, you're right. I mean, we, we, see, um, we see enormous challenges with the implementation, especially when you say each euro of investment should be um, spent with regards to these um, ecological considerations. Um, um, so far, uh, we see quite the opposite very often that there's um, um, in the investments being done here in Serbia, for example, um, not uh, without regard or without consideration. Um, to, to the environment, um, but I think uh, there's also a bit of a challenge to the framing sometimes. Um, uh, when, when people say that chapter 27 is the most expensive, 
I I'm always kind of tempted to say, yeah, but you know, uh, it would be maybe even more expensive and or, um, or much, much um, more um, expensive actually to not do anything and not to implement chapter 27. Um, we had actually just uh, coming just out of an election campaign in, in Germany and the question there is also still, um, oh, what will it cost? What will it cost? But I think um, the EU went in the Green Deal quite quite um, ahead in um, trying to change that that, that narrative and, and um, focusing on the costs of inaction, actually. Um, but OK, um, I will give it over to, to Pippa Gallup now. Um, as, a, as a response paper, you wrote a um, quite critical paper um, after the action plan came out um, that, that I read. And, um, um, what, according to your assessment, um, is is a way ahead? Is is a good news for for the green agenda implementation? And and what is not? And and where where can we um, you know improve things? Thanks very much. Yeah, I um, indeed uh, Bankwatch, the organisation which I work for, is is one of the organisations which has been following the green agenda from the beginning. And we're also involved in the NGO forum that's been set up to, to follow the Green Agenda. Um, and, and as Gilmet was saying earlier, um, that CSOs have a, a key role to play. We, we also agree with that. Um, the, the billions of euros which are, are coming to the region in increased EPA funding require also increased public scrutiny to make sure they really end up being used for the right purposes. Um, I think the, the main issue for us so far is, is actually about the process, um, which then has also consequences for the content of the action plan. Um, the, the NGO forum was set up with the idea of kind of organizing civil society, having us coordinated to respond to the, the developments within the, the uh, process. But unfortunately, within the last year, we've had the situation where for months and months and months, nobody exactly knew what was happening with the action plan. Nobody was able to provide us with a draft. Nobody was able to say, will it be adopted in Slovenia or not at the summit? And then two weeks before the summit, we were given a draft and said, please, can you come with comments in one week, you know, one week before the summit, you know, it's obvious that not much is going to change in that plan. So um, this, this really didn't set a, a good um, start for the, the whole process because we are now, you know, we want to play a key role, but we are struggling to do this because we, we don't now understand how we can impact on this process and how we can really now fix actually what, what we think are the, the deficiencies of the action plan. Um, a lot of this is, is contextual. The green agenda takes place in the situation, like Radovan said, with really very delayed uh, transposition of legislation. And in a lot of ways, I mean, we would also like to continue to focus on this transposition of legislation because we are now in the situation where the, the, the action plan comes along and kind of with its 58 measures, it's kind of a flood of, of new ideas mixed in with a few old ideas. It, it's really a bombardment. And, and now there's really quite a, a threat that some of this gets lost simply because there's so much of it. And, and the action plan doesn't really help us there. And, and it's also quite brief about really how these points are gonna be implemented. So you'll have you know, a point like, um, something like uh, increase the uptake of best available techniques by 2030, but you know, there are different processes. There are, there are bits of that which need to be broken down. You know? All of those countries at the moment have in the legislation that best available techniques must be used. Some of them need to define the best available techniques and so on. There is a lot of stages to make that whole thing happen. And, and this action plan doesn't really explain any of that or break down any of the timelines or, or how that's gonna happen. So um, we, we feel that, you know, I, I called my blog post, you know, on this, this top tech, you know, 
quality qual quantity over quality because you know this is this is what I'm very worried about this kind of bombardment of new measures with no real clarity on how it's going to be implemented. Um, so with the with the aim of kind of going forward, we were trying to really brainstorm. You know, we've 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 had the Sofia Declaration that we were not able to impact on a civil society. We've had the action plan which we are not able to to impact on, and and that will only be updated in three years' time, which is really quite long. Um, and so, you know, what is the next opportunity for us to concretely do something? So, I mean, our main proposal at the moment is, is really to have a kind of broken down action plan um, for, for maybe annual action so that we could really start to, to make these implementation points more concrete and, and more somehow tangible and, and um, to see really how concretely we could we could move forward in a way that civil society is really involved and not that we are just running behind all the time trying to catch up. Thank you, thank you, Pippa. Um, um, actually, um, Radovan, do you have to leave and um, at by twelve, or because then I would like to give you the floor now back. Uh, yes, for time to listen to. Uh, to go around uh, intervention first. Yes, uh, I will have to leave soon. I'm following in parallel another meeting. Our session is a bit late on another meeting, so maybe it's right time. If I have two, three minutes just to, sure. to, okay, go ahead. to yeah. agree to agree and to reply to Pippa. Uh, yes, uh, honestly, I fully understand uh, Pippa's concerns and I have to, to fully agree with her. And uh, in terms of uh, her concerns about the content of the action plan, and of course, with the unfortunate situation and fact that uh, we as RCC didn't provide enough time for the NGO community to reflect uh, on the draft action plan, that, that, that's the truth. Uh, actually, but just simply to explain the whole context, the establishment, establishment of the NGO forum was my idea and I put it into, I inserted it uh, in the action plan itself. So now it is kind of set in stone that NGO forum will have to play uh, an important role uh, in, the, in the process of the implementation of the SOFIA declaration. And not only because of the ARCUS convention and the importance of having uh, NGO, the civil society organizations around the table, but also having in, my, in mind really great uh, expertise and experience that is accumulated uh, in the NGO sector. So that was our intention. And that was personally my idea when, when we drafting the, the action plan. Unfortunately, due to some organizational issues and uh, unforeseen uh, prolongation of process of preparation, it took us more time than expected and we were not able to deliver first draft uh, in July uh, as it was initially planned. And that's the reason why we leave not enough time to the, to the NGO community to, to contribute uh, before the, the action plan is adopted at the, the Burga Summit. However, I think there are, there are other opportunities and something what I will really try to, to make sure in the future is really to, to have them included in the process uh, in the future. So uh, there is opportunity to develop something what, what people already mentioned, kind of annual action program or concrete work plan uh, where we will ensure participation uh, of, the, of the NGO forum. Uh, another thing talking about the, the, the content, uh, of the action plan, I'm fully aware that, that is not, it is not an ideal document. Uh, it is rather commitment of Western Balkan government to start working on this. It has a lot of shortcomings, but uh, we were somehow, uh, our intention was to prepare a document which will, some, which will oblige Western Balkan governments to, to stick to, the, to climate neutrality and all other objectives of the European Green Deal, not to have ideal document. We have some, we had some uh, limitations in terms of, of course, money, in terms of human capacity. Unfortunately, all activities related to the action plans are one man show here in, in the RCC. So as of the next year, I hope we will increase our capacities. And in terms of content, uh, we all have opportunity to work on it. 
uh, in the future and develop other mechanisms and tools which will support uh, the Western Balkan governments. So I stop here. Thanks a lot. Thanks. I will try to follow to follow this meeting in parallel with another one. Very very shortly. I don't know any um, concrete next steps. Um, any big rendezvous that that we should all know about. Um, where do you see like what's what's your horizon for the for the next um, big step in taking this forward? Uh, talking about next step, uh, we are planning to organize a ministerial, big ministerial meeting at regional levels, which will, which should include not only ministers of environment, but all other ministers for responsible for policy areas covered by the, by the green agenda. Uh, we are planning to organize NGO forum meeting uh, to discuss all opportunities and to develop uh, various tools together with, with civil societies organizations. And, and, and uh, of course, we will be able then to, to work hand in hand. And that would be in brief. Okay. And of course, we, we, we secured some money for, for cooperation with NGO. We also secured some money for developing of regional uh, biodiversity strategic plan for, the, for 2020. So I think we have this budget for, for somehow coordinating all these activities. Okay, interesting, because when I could understand correctly, the CBD COP, uh, COP15 that uh, Gimet Vache mentioned also in her um, keynote in Kunming, China will be, uh, will have its um, final um, meeting in April of next year. And sure. um, if, there, if there should be, if there shall be a, a common position by the Western Balkans um, on that CBD COP, which, which is an interesting Indeed. point of the, of the action plan, um, then, of course, um, you would need respective meetings um, and consultations beforehand. Okay, thanks a lot. Indeed. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Goran, I'm very sorry. Just quickly, uh, Gimet Vache, if it's okay for you, um, uh, because she has, to, she has to leave very quickly, and I just wanted to give her quickly the floor to be able to respond before she leaves. Sorry. Yes, thank you very much, Simon. Just to indeed agree with all what uh, Radovan and uh, Pipa have been, uh, have been saying, just to add maybe uh, on two points. So on the COP, as you just mentioned, uh, just to explain that there is basically a, a biodiversity démarche, which is done by the EU, but globally, and which will, of course, include the Western Balkans. So, of course, joining forces with, uh, with the Western Balkans on uh, having a, a common position uh, will be part of, uh, of, the, of this démarche. And, and then just on the, um, the proposal by, by, PIPA, by PIPA on, on having this uh, more detailed action plan uh, annually, just to, to, to say that indeed it's, uh, I mean, I take it as a, a very good uh, proposal and, and to explain that um, uh, we also, as Next Step, have a regional project starting beginning of next year, which will basically be there to, to do exactly that. So to, to, to sit with nat each national authority and, and decline the green agenda from a regional to a more national level and, and look at which action can be made uh, uh, in, uh, in one year and for the, the rest of, uh, of, uh, of the decade, basically. So that was just to add, uh, add this. And uh, yeah, I would like to thank you very much and, and apologize again for calling in earlier. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you for making that point. Um, Gordon Sekulic, over to you now. I'm very sorry um, that, uh, that this was a bit um, um, and messed up in, in terms of the structure. Um, we know that the WWF Adria is, uh, is basically federating different coalitions 27 now on a regional level. Um, we as Heinrich Böll Stiftung are working for a couple of years now with the coalition 27 here in Serbia. Uh, quite successfully so in terms of um, providing a um, quali quality shadow report to the um, progress or non-progress on chapter 27. Um, so it would be very interesting to have your um, perspective finally on um, from the civil society um, and, and, and in the region also on implementation. Thank you. Um, thank you. Good morning, everyone. So yeah, first of all, I would like to maybe to explain the, 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 this let's say mechanism that we call Coalition 27. That's actually a group or network of uh, organizations which are focused on the monitoring of EU accession of the country in the field of environment and climate change. And uh, these uh, members of the coalition are ex actually monitoring, analyzing the, uh, the progress of the country within the whole field of, of environment and climate change. And then 
we are producing a year um, annual progress report, which we call a shadow progress report. And uh, based on the good experience from the Serbia and, and Montenegro, where these coalitions have been uh, established first, uh, we and we try to 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 expand this uh, idea into other Western Balkan countries. Then the, the first actually after the coalitions in, in Montenegro and uh, and uh, uh, Serbia, there was uh, the coalition uh, Green 27 in Albania was established and uh, a partnership 27 in Bosnia and Herzegovina established two years ago. After that, uh, actually, right now, the, in this time, the, the, our colleagues in North Macedonia are, are presenting their first shadow report. And this year, we have also initiated the, the Coalition 27 in Kosovo. So the, the logical next step would be to, was to actually coordinate this uh, coalition um, across the region. And, and this year, we as well initiated the regional network. Of, of the coalition. Uh, the, the, the coalitions um, prove to be uh, very constructive partners and they're, they become, I mean, for that this older coalition, which are already established in Serbia and Montenegro, they, are, uh, they became recognized by, by the EU institution and the non national governments are, as important factors, actors in the, in the uh, accession process in the field of environment and, and climate change and our reports are read in the, in, the, in Brussels in the, in, the, in the national governments and I think it's really a good mechanism to to uh, enable this cooperation between the CSOs and uh, and uh, governments and really to to mm, let's say operation operationalize uh, this CSO inputs for this this process. And now we are. To, we would try now to summarize the sum of the of the uh, uh, regional issue. Let's call it like them. There are a lot of lot of similarities across the countries. Um, a lot of issues are common. And very quickly from from the reports we have now, there there are few issues which are uh, common for all the countries, I, and I think they are relevant. Uh, very relevant for for green green agenda and for the action plan. First of all, uh, we deal with lack of transparency uh, transparency in um, all the countries in regards development of new strategies and laws. That's the common issue everywhere. Of course, there is a lack of capacity, but a lack of experience and practice from from governmental side uh, on this matter. Uh, and I think very, very challenging here in the region are the capacities of the governments, uh, especially in regards uh, and environment and especially in regards uh, nature conservation and biodiversity conservation. I think that's, a, that's quite critical for the implementation, implementation of green agenda and that should be tackled very carefully and I think strategically in the future planning of the implementation of, of green agenda. Of course, there is a, uh, we have to be, yeah, critical on, on, as well towards the, the CSO, the CSOs as well, the which, CSOs which are active in the region, there is no, let's say not many uh, well-developed uh, and, uh, and CSOs which with capacities who can really, uh, effectively contribute to all these processes. So we have to be aware that the CSOs as well have limited capacities. Uh, good thing is that in past few years, we have a, let's say, increase of, of uh, public awareness, uh, merging of a lot of local initiatives, dealing with environment, which is good thing, but there is still a lot of work to, to uh, on uh, raising, let's say, the capacities of the, of the CSOs and, and uh, local initiatives. Um, so when, when talking about the green agenda, and implement, I, I can only support all that that people already uh, told. Uh, we share the same experience with the, uh, actually we feel the same uh, about the, this process of preparation of the plan. 
And now there's, as, as already said, there is, there is a lot of unclarities, uh, both from our, our side, but I would say also from the um, yeah, governmental side, from the people who, who really uh, should work on that. I think it's still very general. Um, and we still miss the clear orientation and directions how it will be implemented. Uh, I don't want to, you know, to sound too pessimistic. I'm optimistic. I think it's very, very important document and the, both the agenda and the plan. And we really need something that it's bringing back focus to biodiversity and nature conservation in the region. But I think that I, we are just cautious and uh, um, having known the how the how the the things were going in the past 10 years we cannot be too you know we have to be cautious uh, and again uh, repeating that the, the on the one one hand we have very limited capacities in the in the governments the other other things other thing is um, intersectoral cooperation, uh, which is when we look at these numerous um, uh, actions within the, 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 the action plan, we have to be aware that it's most of them, of them are not possible without really effective intersectoral cooperation. And that's what we miss. We were talking a, lo a lot about biodiversity mainstream, but it has not happened at least in this region. Um, and in regards to, to biodiversity targets, um, I'm very happy to see that, you know, we, the, the EU strategy and the regional strategy are now focused on the protecting biodiversity and there is a target of 30% uh, of the protected areas of the territory, which is very, I would say a high percentage for the, for the countries in the region. It's obvious that they, and actually we cannot reach that percentage only with nationally established protected areas. So Natura 2000 is, would be, I think, the main mechanism to reach that target. And the capacities there are quite limited. So on the, something is happening in there. There are a lot, a lot of EU projects. Uh, from country to country, it's different, but I think that so that the Natura 2000 should be a key for reaching this target, as well with other effective means um, of protection, which are which should be enabled. So we don't have them in the region right now. We don't have clear view how we should achieve that. But again, I think that the key um, would be to really. Uh, mobilize the sources, resources to, to development of Natura 2000. And not only development, establishment, but um, managing. Managing is as well the key issues. We know the, uh, one of the key issues, we know that uh, biodiversity targets are also focusing on the, on the quality of management, on the strict protection, and there is where we also have a huge issues in the region. So, yeah, that's that's in short. I hope that. Thanks a lot, um, um, Goran. Yeah, actually, um, we were both just on a panel um, a week ago in Sremski Karlovac, where we were where we were talking about the effective protection of uh, the Fruška Gora um, uh, forest in uh, in the north of of Serbia in Vojvodina, and um, I think that was a very um, yeah concrete example of um, where effective protection really um, should should be at the forefront and also maybe coordination of um, of protected areas i mean um, there was the idea of um, of coordinating and, and basically um, exchange of different national parks and, and protected areas in the region um, with regards to best practice um, as a way forward but we already have a um, a first question um, pipa already was so kind in, in answering it already in the chat. Um, if if uh, Radovan or Goran, you also would like to um, say something about it, it's actually about the dilemma, let's say, of the Komarnica um, uh, Canyon in Montenegro, um, a, uh, where there's a plan to build a hydropower plant, which we know um, very well from the region, unfortunately, in an Emerald and Natura 2000 site. 
And the question is, where's the silver bullet um, of decision-making to solve this conflict in favor of con conserv conservation, biodiversity and sustainable rural development? Um, yes, and I would like to almost, I'm a bit tempted to add that, you know, in energy policy, we now have maybe as a silver bullet, something like CBAM, you know, the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is which really puts a lot of pressure in, in, um, on, uh, on, on reducing carbon intensive um, economy, potentially, when it will be introduced. Um, uh, but, you know, do we need something like that, um, a CBAM for biodiversity as well? Or um, how, how, how would you respond to that? Goran or Radovan, as, as you like, people already responded um, nicely in the in the chat. Um, yeah, I I agree with uh, with the uh, with the response in the in the chat, and we we, we were uh, working a lot of uh, on the preventing this uh, uh, bad practice on the, on uh, with development of the small hydropower across the Balkans, and that 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 is a. Uh, let's say still a huge issue um i think the one part is to you know develop protection or conservation mechanism through natura 2000 e legislation on, or national legislation but on the other side we know that the real issue there uh is the support of the government's or economic support to do, to, for development of, of these projects. And there, this is the, the point where we should as well work and try to eliminate these bad incentives which are, or incentives which are supporting uh, practices which are actually damaging biodiversity. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Radovan, would you like to, you, you actually mentioned the, for, the point of enforcement again in the chat, would you like to elaborate on it? Yes, maybe I can, I can say a few words in addition. But what I, I really think it is a big challenge for the Western Balkans is enforcement of legislation. Despite we have maybe ideal laws which are in line, uh, aligned with, uh, with the EU ones, EU legislation, uh, the enforcement uh, in, in the fields uh, very often is uh, uh, a, chal a challenge. So, first of all, I think we have to strengthen capacities of authorities in the Western Balkans uh, to, uh, of course, establish adequate uh, bodies for inspection, for surveillance, surveillance, and then uh, to ensure enforcement and to avoid any any kind of political support to these, uh, these kind of projects we, which have a negative environmental impacts. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, inspections, political will is uh, the definitely recurring um, themes of, of uh, nature protection. Okay, I would like to really open the floor to, to everyone to ask questions. Um, I'm seeing I'm seeing some of them now in the chat. One second. Is there, is there a possibility that the EU delegations, each of the countries, play a role in bringing the governments and the CSO um, closer together? How do you interpret the events in Serbia regarding the case of lithium and Rio Tinto? Is um, Olivera Rakic is asking this. Who would like to answer? Yeah, <laughs> obviously I can. Ahead, yeah. since, I'm, since I'm based in Serbia, I would, I would try to answer. Um, yeah, this this the whole process of of, of um, or the whole case of Rio Tinto and lithium uh, uh, in Serbia is quite problematic uh, from different perspectives. You know, at the end, it's a really a uh, uh, with uh, the project with. Which brings a lot of risks for, to to biodiversity, but to the health of the people and the environment in general. But on the other hand, we don't have a transparent, you know, clear, uh, logical process of how we are um, assess, how we assess this project. How do we know is, if it's really really acceptable or not? The 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 whole uh, 
the whole this process of licensing, let's say that the, in, in general, it's, it's a mess actually, you know, that the government is bringing the, some local uh, spatial plans, then in some studies are appearing. And then we, now we hear that it will be um, uh, approved uh, after the, the process of uh, uh, environmental impact assessment. And it's, I, I can only say it's a quite, uh, the, it is done in a way it shouldn't be. And uh, having on one side the, the really, you know, a huge risk for the for the environment in general, for the people, and this uh, uh, really, how to say, slumpy process of of, of uh, uh, licensing. That's 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 not good. Simply, it's not, not a good practice. And uh, yeah, we are quite. Uh, quite uh, cautious about of the project and i think it it should be somehow the whole process and discussion about this should be restarted okay yeah thank you yeah i can only um, agree to what you said uh, to the whole mess uh, or disorder <laughs> is also adding this com these uh, discussions um on referendum now and expropriation there was a uh, uh, quite a lot of protests last weekend around the questions becoming it's become quite a hot political uh, topic which is on the one hand uh, very good that actually the protests of today in Serbia they are ecological in nature um, um, in a way but of course there's there's really the risk um, that also we're facing here in this discussion that you know we have all these great strategies and action plans and and things and on the if you ask people on the streets of, uh, of Belgrade or or in the region uh, they will tell you well um, you know uh, we are building our governments are building hydropower plants new coal power plants and um and are um are basically digging out the last resources we have to to sell them so um there's really a risk that that there's this this big divide or or um yeah that, that there's a lack of touch of, of these um eu um policies and the and 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 actually even the policies of, of the country sometimes. But Pippa would like to um, say something on the question of EU delegations. Please go ahead, Pippa. Yeah, and maybe on also this, this last question that popped up as well, because I, my answer was oh, yeah. going to touch on that. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think um, in this situation that we are now, potentially the, the EU delegations can play some kind of a role um, in, in trying to get civil society involved in different processes, but the, the EU delegations rely more on, you know, just speaking to the institutions and, and kind of just their, their goodwill, really. Um, the, the actual conditions for this involvement have to be set in, in the different places. And one of these was um, what we were asking for was to have um, in the um, in the delic in the regulation that was uh, recently approved on the EPA funds uh, was this, this partnership principle, which is used within the EU to insist that in spending some of the like cohesion funds and so on, that civil society is involved in certain ways. And, and this is not in this regulation. And, and this means that it's now very much up to the, the goodwill of, of everyone to just talk. And apart from, I mean, there are different there is different legislation that requires um, public participation on like strategic environmental impact assessments of projects and environmental impact assessments. But if we are talking really about, you know, intense, really in-depth kind of constant contact with the institutions, this is, this is more or less now relying on goodwill. And I think this is a really big missed opportunity for the EU. And um, and I, I'm pretty frustrated about this. I I'm I also you know I I fear it might be also connected to the the whole issue that we have with the EU of enlargement. And you know we have the the enlargement commissioner who was you know the candidate of the Hungarian government. So I mean they are definitely no friends of public participation so you know i think we have a really serious uh problem coming from the top actually in the eu with regard to the region about the the involvement of civil society and 
and really how how to make that happen and a lot of missed opportunities and and i think now it's up to us to just push a lot very persistently very annoyingly and very loudly to to con you know to get involved because we were we were also raising the point on the green agenda of um okay we have this regional ngo forum now which as i said earlier we haven't been adequately involved but it exists and now there will be actions on the national level that will happen and our question was well how will that be ensured that the national ngos will be included in those national processes and the the answer coming from the discuss, last discussion we had with with rcc and the the ec was well we can't make the national government so i mean this is completely unsatisfactory these are eu funds and these should be really you know conditions should be set on how they are going to be decided on and used and and the eu is not using its leverage here so i'm i'm quite frustrated about this and and i think uh, not only the leverage but in 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 response also to this other question about the um the the ec generally kind of losing its credibility in the in the region i mean yeah i think this is a clear worry um i i saw various people on on twitter this weekend you know as as the serbian um government appears to have you know hired thugs to beat protesters and I know on the other hand, you have to quote from the the uh, president of the European Commission saying that Serbia did great progress in the rule of law, you know, in the last year, well done, you're doing great. So, you know, these are really bad messages sometimes, totally inappropriate coming from the EU. Uh, there is, you know, a lack of reaction to certain events that really need a reaction. And, you know, I, I really am frustrated because we, we really value the EU legislation, we really value uh, the advantages that EU membership would bring for the region, and we are kind of trying to promote all this. And, you know, I feel like the EU itself is, you know, making our job very hard, you know, who wants to promote the EU when it's, you know, it's not coming up with the goods on enlargement, it's not backing, you know, its own values in the region often so it, it's really um very difficult time and yeah unfortunately again no silver bullet just a lot of reaction and and calling people up for this needs to be done constantly thank you yeah i think uh, i think you're completely right and we share uh, we share this frustration and um, the, the eu's lack of using its, its leverage is quite um it's quite a topic um, over the across the board, actually, of different topics. Um, there's two other questions that I would like to um, forward to the um, uh, to the panelists. One is the inclusion of CSO and CSOs and access to of media in projects affecting biodiversity. How can the EU and RCC help to guarantee the inclusion of of um, CSOs? Um, and then there's also the question, basically, from the perspective of CSOs. Is there a plan of training for the implementation of the action plan so that um, actually uh, those who are interested can um, can can get training and um, and learn the correct tools for implementation of the action plan of the green agenda? Radovan, over to you. Okay, maybe maybe I can try to provide answer on some questions that arise, it is pretty difficult for me to follow because I have two meetings in parallel, plus all these questions that are popping up in the, in the chat box. It's not easy to follow everything. Uh, just uh, quickly, regarding the engagement and inclusion of CSOs and media, we already discussed uh, inclusion of CSO. Uh, our intention at the beginning, just maybe to, to, to emphasize this for the, for the broader audience, at the beginning, we identified maybe 70 or 80 various NGOs from the Western Balkans, but also those, let's say, most prominent from the EU member states like Bankwatch, like the Nature Conservancy and, and many others. So uh, during our constitutional uh, meeting of the NGO forum, we invited all of them to discuss uh, 
potential involvement, broader involvement of the CSO community in the implementation of the Green Agenda. And later on, thanks to the, to the NGO chair and other colleagues who, who supported her, uh, there was a study, conducted a study on asking all these NGOs who would really like to be uh, deeply involved in the process, who is ready to invest some energy and time in the process. And we came out with, actually the chair came out with approximately, people, you can correct me, with approximately 30 NGOs who expressed interest to be uh, actively involved in the future. So out of maybe 80, we now have 30 uh, organizations that will be involved. About involve inclusion of media, good idea. The action plan does not foresee so far the broader inclusion of, of media and somehow closer cooperation, but good idea and maybe worth thinking of this and finding opportunities for, for better involvement of media in the future. Regarding the training, we in RCC uh, are planning some somehow strengthening capacities of national authorities. Uh, in the future, we also provided some budget for, for various activities for the next year. Uh, we planned several study visits in EU member states, but unfortunately due to well-known situation, we couldn't organize them uh, during this year, but hopefully we will, uh, we will be able to, to, to organize study tours and other training um, tr trainings during 2020. So please uh, contact us in case of any ideas and proposals uh, for so trainings for national authorities and NGO are, NGOs are possible uh, uh, and can be, can be somehow supported by our side. And also one more thing, what, what Pipa mentioned about involvement of uh, NGOs, uh, ensuring uh, participation of NGOs uh, at, in national, uh, in process of development of national policies. That is something what, what I think my colleagues mentioned during the, the meetings, meeting we had a month ago with NGO Forum. Unfortunately, we as a regional organization and as a platform for cooperation at a regional level, we do not have instruments to push governments or somehow to to, to make sure that NGOs are involved in national consultations. There are uh, also other laws that regulate this, like horizontal legislation, which uh, uh, foresees involvement of civil society in development of all strategic documents and uh, all, all, all facilities that will have impact on environment. And we cannot somehow push uh, Western Balkan governments and ensure this. However, I think that through participation of the NGO forum in these regional processes and participation at regular meetings, which will be organized at operational and ministerial level, level regularly and uh, in annual cycles, we have opportunities somehow, it, it can be used as a, as, as a door to enter uh, the process to, to ensure, let's say, participation and to consider discuss participation in national consultations. I stop here, over. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sorat Ranwan, for, for laying that out. Yeah, I mean, I definitely see some interlinkages with what uh, Goran said about um, a regional um, alliance of coalitions 27 and, um, and the structures foreseen in the action plan for civil society consultations. Um, uh, if that is in the uh, regional working group on environment or the um, and basically the NGO forum um, um, as support mechanisms, but of course it has to be um, done in a way that it's meaningful and, and relevant um, as, as always with these kind of NGO forums. It shouldn't be kind of a parallel, nice to have um, 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 situation that, that we've seen in other contexts. Um, um, okay, any other... Any other questions from the audience or comments from the panelists? Um, I don't have, I don't see anything right now else in the chat or in the Q&A. Everybody seems to be, there seems to be definitely a lot of um, worry about the Komarnica uh, Canyon, which is, uh, which, which rightfully so is a, is a priority. Um, Okay, but if there's no other further questions or, or comments, um, Goran, about this um, NGO forum, do you see the 
do you do you, do you feel hopeful about um, about this being being relevant actually in the in the context of the the green agenda action plan? Uh, uh, yes, I think, but it, it should be somehow the the work of this forum should be you know brought to 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 another level to be more effective and open for 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 CSOs. I think that's I mean that's the the only way we can. Uh, 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 effectively take uh, uh, influence the, the the whole process so we need to be to 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 discuss it and forum is probably one of yeah one of the ways we or the mechanism we uh, we can do it I, I think that uh, these uh, coalitions and, and our regional network will support the work of, of any 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 uh, work in that direction of connecting and, and discussing the whole whole process um one thing is uh this this kind of regional uh let's say discussions and and and, and a, a forum but on the other hand we had a, we have a lot of issues on the national level to reach the governments and to really take part in in any any public discussions related to laws to strategies or whatever so yeah. we really have a bad experience there and it's getting worse more or less in older older region um partly because of the pandemic situation but that's only a, let's say a, um i wouldn't say that that's that that's the the main reason and uh, yeah. um, Related to that, what what people was talking about, and someone mentioned the political will in the uh, yeah. comments in the question. So there, we really somehow I really feel uh, discouraged with the, how the EU is letting the national governments go with these uh, declarations. You know, one thing is political level uh, will. They signed the document. They are supporting the, this, but on the technical level, nothing is really happening. So you don't have the integration of biodiversity. Uh, climate actions are quite inconsistent. Inconsistent. In one document, you say we will go for uh, decarbonizations, but then you have at the same time you have a national document which are very. They, the government is planning a new carbon plant, new coal plants, and so on. There are a lot of such examples, and um, I'm, I'm, I think that really, so to make a distinction between this uh, regional discussion on the West and Balkan Green Agenda and the Action Plan, and and the the other part is this, how to actually ensure that uh, on the national level on the quite technical level, the CSOs are engaging and providing inputs and influencing policies. Yeah, thanks for thanks for making that point. Okay, um, I think that is a good um, a good last uh, a good last word. I would hand it over to Mr. Wright from the Southeast uh, Europe Association. Thank you all for coming, for being here. Thanks to the panelists for. Um, for your answers and comments and inputs and um, and thanks to the audience for your for your questions and um, and discussion points um, all the best and we keep on fighting and uh, and, and keeping this uh, network a vivid one for for biodiversity in europe thank you over to you mr Bay. well thank you very much simon ilse for this uh, well chairing uh, this panel uh, with, with all your experience that you have. Uh, thank you uh, to all the participants in this uh, panel. I think this was a great first panel, um, a great start for a conference, which was supposed, supposed, supposed to be in, in presence, as you remember, um, which was supposed to be a much more comprehensive even. And so uh, we are looking forward to this conference uh, in, in about three months time. Just uh, let me uh, point out some things that I took from, from this discussion and this all, which is also uh, referring uh, to what we can expect from, from the conference uh, uh, in the future. 
uh, I took one point I, and I think we all have to recognize that it's in a very, very important point. This is the connection between biodiversity loss and climate change. Um, Yemet has mentioned this in the very beginning and within the conference, you can expect a keynote from one senior researcher, Esther Kellerman from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services and which is exactly on this also recent report, you probably uh, noticed uh, from the International Panel on Climate Change and the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So this is an issue which is very important and we will uh, still dwell on this. And then of course, it's always uh, an issue, this is the inclusion and the networking of the civil societies. That's exactly what we are also uh, trying to do with uh, our fora. And it's, it also for us means that we have a kind of intersectoral networking of civil society organizations, because I mean, it's, it's a high necessity and, and need to create a network between those active uh, in the field of uh, biodiversity and nature conversation. And for example, those people dealing with energy transition, I think this is an all, also a very uh, important issue. Um, PIPA's uh, uh, demand was on more concrete steps and, and actions. And I think uh, we will discuss about uh, these more concrete uh, steps and actions looking at, at uh, the action plan, but whatever is done on the EU level and on the national uh, levels in the Western Balkans, this will also be a, an outcome of our uh, conference. Uh, another issue, we have to include many stakeholders, including the local governments. This is a very important issue. And also this was uh, rarely mentioned here, but uh, this is what we are convinced about, also including the media, meaning the media from the region, but also media uh, from Western Europe. We have invited several correspondents from uh, German uh, leading journals who were supposed to come to our uh, conference and we still expect them. So uh, expecting that our issues, our topics will receive an additional uh, uh, attendance and, 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 and interest uh, also from the side of Western media. Um, well, um, you have seen probably that there are a lot of issues still to be discussed. And uh, with this, I uh, uh, give the perspective for our international workshop. And uh, we are looking forward to this conference, uh, of course. And, and we have seen this. We have now organized this panel, including uh, the, Euro Commission, uh, the European Commission and the uh, Regional Cooperation Council. But of course, there will be another panel at this conference in three months time, including these two central organizations into a conference and there's a high necessity. So uh, I will send out a uh, save the date also to Radovan and to Guillemet and uh, to all participants here. With this, I close this uh, small uh, discussion. Thanks uh, to all of you contributing. Thank you again to Simon Ilse for uh, your sharing this and have a nice day and uh, stay healthy. All the best and bye-bye.